I should have known when I got there and I couldn't find parking that there was an issue because DC is usually really easy to find parking. And so I par- parked in my usual spot and I, I walked down to Pennsylvania Avenue and there was just thousands of people walking towards the Capitol building. And so I just joined the crowd and started walking towards the Capitol. And they had already pushed up onto the steps of the Capitol and it was just mayhem. And then I went around to the east side of the Capitol. They had pushed up onto the steps of that and that's actually where they were breaching the Capitol and going inside of it. Welcome to The Practical Filmmaker, an educational podcast brought to you by the Filmmaker Institute and Sunscreen Film Festival, where industry professionals talk nuts and bolts and the steps they took to find their success today. On today's show, Timothy Wolford talks humanitarian documentary, The Insurrection and the Wide Open Market in DC. Find the full transcripts and more at thepracticalfilmmaker.com. I'm your host, Tanya Musgrave, and today we have Emmy Award-winning documentary director, filmmaker extraordinaire, Timothy Wolfer. His work has taken him to over 40 countries covering humanitarian aid and human rights topics for his documentaries and work for the UN. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Let's start with your journey so far. How did you get here? Yeah, so I decided to become a filmmaker When I was still in high school, I was super intrigued by it. And I contacted the local PBS station. I was like, hey, you know, I I wanna like internship. Would you guys do that for me? And they were like, sure, come on down. I happened to have taught myself Final Cut Pro 4 at the time. So after the internship, they realized I knew how to edit and hired me as a video editor. And that's kind of how I started into the the filmmaking thing and eventually went out to to film school. And then the humanitarian Mm -hmm. stuff came after I I did some traveling in college and was like, it's super addicted to it. And I was like, wow, Mm -hmm. wonder if I could actually make money by traveling. So (laughs) that's what I did is I put the, you know, designed wool for productions. And as a side note, if you're ever going to start a production company, don't name it after yourself. But like the stupid mistakes you make in college, because everyone knows that it's about you and like it's it's hard to uh, expand it and stuff like that. So (laughs) but for better or worse, that's what I did. I was in college when I started the company and uh, and I put the two passions for both travel and filmmaking together. And then when the uh, the Haiti earthquake hit in 2010, Mm. I hitchhiked in about four days afterwards and, and put mm. together a film. And we'll talk about that maybe more later, but that kind of cemented in my passion for, for humanitarian aid and all these NGOs that were doing this incredible work to, to you know, help the island out at the time, you know, wanting yeah. to work for them and serve them. So that's kind of yeah. how that all evolved. Somebody was talking about it. They're like, yeah, Tim Wolfer, he can get in like anywhere. And I'm just like, how do you get into Haiti? Because they shut that down. Yeah, it's, they, had, they had shut down the airport. And they, okay. it was just for humanitarian flights. So so we flew, a friend and I, we flew into the Dominican Republic. Yeah. And then we uh, we just simply like took taxis and buses. And at one yeah. point, I remember spending several hours in the back of a truck, just like, <laughs> you know, with my camera equipment and everything piled on top of me, yeah. just like for hours through the night of Haiti, oh my gosh. mountains of oh Haiti. My gosh. I remember you talking about even being in South Sudan and one particular thing that stood out to me in my memory was stepping over a human spine, you know, that kind of stuff. So I did a bunch of work a couple of years ago in South Sudan, uh, a couple of different trips for for different agencies and then also for the UN Migration Agency. That was very intense because like, here's a country that's like, they seceded from the northern part of Sudan and now they're their own country. And then it, it fell into a civil war primarily across ethnic lines, not totally, but for the most part. And so it's just a really sad situation. You have a country that has very little to no infrastructure. I mean, there are no roads, there's no you know, water systems, sanitation systems. And so it's, it's a difficult context. And, and because of this war, it's led to some horrific sites. And, and you know, so they hired us to come down and put, down, put together some case study films about it. And yeah, there were some horrific things there for sure. If that's what you would call a defining moment in your experience. I mean, definitely like hitchhiking into Haiti in college was a defining experience Mm. and just the realities of the world and realizing there's millions of ways people can live their lives and it's all okay. 
and like mm. how short and delicate life is and how I wanted to do stuff with my own life that like, yeah, I want to do stuff with my own life that like, like I would be proud of and that I could sleep well at night and like mm. wake up every day doing what I actually want to be doing. Cause I think mm-hmm. we can fall into patterns a lot of times and, and mm. I refuse to do that. So that's awesome too, because there's, I mean, it's very easy to kind of get sucked into like, all right, first of all, you need to eat kind of thing. Like, okay, what can I take that will just like, let me eat. <laughs> um, it, it can feel like you don't have a choice, you know, in what you're doing, but it is it is possible to go off the beating track of what most filmmakers what you'll learn in film school if i can for a moment yeah yeah uh so like after college i moved back to grand rapids michigan for a couple of years and i got into a small business like incubator kind of a thing Uh, not an incubator it would have been co-working space but there was a lot of like people that were senior they could mentor and stuff a couple of them kind of helped me define what the production company should look like and just old school business, like, you know, if you want to be doing something, hang out your shingle and say, this is what I'm an expert in, and then just figure it out. That went a really long ways and is like something people can uh, can do if you want to like make a, if you want to be, you know, the filmmaker of, of puppy breeding or something like that, <laughs> you know, hang out a shingle that says, we are the experts in filmmaking on puppy breeding. And then, like, just go start shooting docs, you know, for free or, like, selling your services. Mm-hmm. And, I, and that's one of the fun things about filmmaking, right? Is, like, you can, yeah. like, meet people that know nothing about filmmaking and you're bringing mm-hmm. your skill set and then they have an expertise and, like, you're learning from them and they're learning mm-hmm. from you. And, like, it can be this beautiful synergy. Mm-hmm. Just find a niche and, and you know, get yes, a Squarespace website and a $25 <laughs> business license and open a bank account and throw a hundred bucks in there and go. It's not yeah. that hard. And so you, you figured out that this is what you want to do in order to like, you know, support yourself, make money, but then also feel like you could feel good about what you were, what you were making. So you seem to have an affinity for the humanitarian stories and political philosophy. Would you say that like Haiti is kind of like where that started? I think so. I think it developed. Haiti definitely like got me started in curiosity about like what happens after disasters and stuff like this and how do people rebuild their lives and everything. And then as it, my career has developed, I've definitely become more and more interested in migrants and, and Haiti. Obviously, there was a portion of that because a lot of people were evacuated to the U.S., but like yeah. really interested in migrants and like here are people that have lost everything who are are so desperate that they are willing to travel to the lengths of the earth to find a better living and mm-hmm. and achieve achieve their dreams i mean they're always like super strong dreamers or migrants like it's just incredible the people that that are coming to our southern border they're incredible people the people that are willing to walk across africa to find better homes or whatever mm-hmm. it might be mm-hmm. and then unfortunately we demonize them uh, mm-hmm. Western countries, you know, mm-hmm. it, politically, we make it as horrible for them as possible. And, and it's it's mm-hmm. just such a tragedy. And it's something that I've just uh, really want to always be spreading a light on is like, that's not the truth. Like, these are incredible people. And so, yeah, I guess that's, uh, that's mm-hmm. where I've evolved to. I, I shot one time in a refugee camp, you know, like the first few days, I, I'm almost useless, like, <laughs> in that yeah. first week. I mean, yes, I'm shooting and I'm doing this stuff, but, like, there's so much of a dichotomy going on in my head. Once you realize the seriousness of the situation, and you're like, what the heck am I able to even do to make a difference? Like, is this going to even really make a difference? And, like, how? And how in the world can the Kardashians <laughs> or something, like, exist in the same world as these people right in front of me? I'm curious what your <laughs> what your balance is. I, I mean, I definitely hear you and have had the same kind of esoteric thoughts yeah, just yeah, during yeah. the situation. So I, I yeah. definitely empathize. I think I think part of it is is you know breaking it down into steps and one, you know, by the time you if you ever do get the opportunity to, to film in a situation like that, definitely uh, make sure you know what you're doing with your gear. Like, Mm. this is not the Mm. time you need to be figuring out how to, like, set your aperture or focus or something like that. Mm. Um, Mm -hmm. But I think part of it is just, first of all, focus on doing your job. But I think Mm. another aspect to that is is, uh, learn to set your camera down and just, like, 
learn and talk to the people in front of you and and that kind of helps break it down into a very human human aspect that can can Mm -hmm. calm that stuff but a lot of times yeah it is overwhelming when you're just like swinging the camera around and you look at your stuff and post and it's like oh my god i got nothing (laughs) and uh yeah once that initial i guess i don't know like the shock not it's it's not like full-on shock but like the sensory overload yeah once that kind of wears off and you're able to you know um have those conversations and find your story find your angle but then also like find your people find your people that you can have those conversations with and that really open up your experience and like shed a light on a very specific area of where you're at you know um like for instance I remember following your Instagram and you headed down to the border. I'm just like, oh, yeah, he's covering uh, the migration and, you know, all of the the stuff that was going on down there at the time. And then I hear about the right girls. Tell me about the right girls. Yeah. So the right girls in my latest film. And that happened very much out of this whole thing about like migrants. Uh, we were just talking about how migrants I know are just like people who have like incredible dreams and stuff ahead of them. So Trump had been tweeting about this caravan of, you know, horrible people coming to the border and he using all these derogatory terms. And I was like, Mm. I know that's not true. That is Mm. a falsehood. So I jumped on a plane and flew to southern Mexico and and found the caravan, you know, caught up with the caravan uh, on the side of the road or whatever. And Mm. uh, and that exact same experience of what you described, that sensory overload was definitely happening. And I hear some music like one afternoon so they had taken a break it was a saturday i think that i had met mm-hmm. up with them and then they were, they were I heard some music and i look over and there's some some people dancing to this music and i just for whatever reason start filming this so i go over and start talking to these these women and they were all transgender women and they had mm-hmm. band together to do the journey together and i was like hey can i come film with you tomorrow when they start walking and they're like sure and so then the next day I was like, hey, can I come film? And they're like, sure. And then the next thing I know, I had done that for six weeks and, and built a very wow, st- very strong relationship with these this group of women. And like uh, yeah. and they eventually like made it to the border. And I was there with one of them, Valentina, and the last one. And she like literally walked up to the border, the U.S. border and customs officials and, and said, hey, I fear for my life and requesting asylum. And uh, went into the United States that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my god! But it was—it's such an amazing relationship because I still, you know, still try and keep in touch with them and stuff. Yeah, best I absolutely. Can. And that's what I mean by like you get to know them on a human level. It's not just sticking a mm-hmm. camera in their face, but like hanging out with them and absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's so interesting how that changes the perspective, even if it's just like a personal thing because honestly if we think about it systemic change happens by having those very very personal experiences when i think of my friend i don't think of the term refugee in fact like it's almost it's cringeworthy yeah it's cringeworthy i'm just like i i I don't like referring to him as that yeah i think of my grandmother moving here from new zealand and and she came through ellis island and the whole works Mm -hmm. Uh, But I don't call her a migrant. She's my grandmother who moved here from New Zealand, right? And I guess like one of my questions before was, you know, what did you feel like you could do to make that much of a difference? I don't know if I making a difference is something that ever crosses my mind. I think that the thing that I feel I can add value to is that I did have the opportunity and the time off and everything like that to put faces behind what Mm -hmm. the news was covering in a Mm -hmm. very wide range, right? They're talking Mm -hmm. about 7,000 people, so that very few people were focusing in on just a few. And it was Mm -hmm. a huge risk I was taking, you know, spending six weeks and not having multiple characters Mm -hmm. for my film. I just had the four characters, and that was Mm -hmm. all I was filming for four weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's the value I thought I could bring, is just, like, having Mm -hmm. that laser focus on this one group that really needed some, some attention. Okay, so I, I haven't been trained in journalism. Okay. And so I, re- I remembered that, particularly for a lot of, I don't know, I want to say humanitarian docs that I've been a part of, I would realize later the fact that I could have caused more damage with my presence <laughs> than actual help. 
because of just like media ethics, I guess. To go into a place where like my camera costs as much as like this village makes in a year, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Um, when I when I was about to go over to the, the refugee camp, I got in touch with one of my journalist friends. I'm just like, hey, any kind of ethics <laughs> like thing that I should be aware of, you know, she was just like, well, before you parachute in and, you know, th- like think that you're going to save the day, like have have a whole lot more understanding and openness, be upfront about like what you're doing and all of that stuff. How do you navigate that? So first of all, yeah, of course, you, you're very upfront. And like with the characters in the film, as what I was doing is evolving, because I thought it would be like a short film, you know, I kept them posted or whatever. But I think that that's part of the thing of like building that relationship and just, you know, building a form of trust. Uh, you know, journalists can spread the gamut, you know, some, some just run in and take pictures of whatever, which is legal. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, if you're on a public street and somebody else is on a public street, you can take the photo and it's a newsworthy topic. It's it falls under the editorial and there's nothing that anyone can do about it. But Mm -hmm. like, I think, you know, asking that permission and and building that rapport and that relationship and being upfront about what you're doing is like, is really the name of the game. What steps did you take to sell your docs? When I went into the right girls, I distributed Adopting Haiti, but that was 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And like the the whole landscape has totally changed for indie filmmakers. And so mm-hmm. it was a bit overwhelming because like, obviously we applied to South by Southwest and the film wasn't quite ready yet. And so like it got rejected from there. And then we applied to a bunch of the big ones and, and got rejected. And I was a bit of a defeatist, like, oh, well, I guess this film is done. And then <laughs> it was thanks to actually Jesse and Johnny and AJ and like this team mm-hmm. that I had that they mm-hmm. kept pushing it and pushing me. And, and so we, just started, and Siobhan, one of the producers, we just started applying to festivals on Mm filmfreeway.com. And I mean, I applied to festivals until my bank account hurt. Like we applied to um, 140 festivals. Oh my gosh. Just like, and everything from the big ones to just like no name festivals that say the word documentary in them or migrant (laughs) or foreign, like anything. Like it's so easy to click, submit, click, submit, Mm -hmm. click, submit. And yeah. through that process, we got into 20 or 25 festivals mm-hmm. and that generated a lot of attention, which mm-hmm. was awesome. And then uh, another one of the producers worked on getting it in front of distribution companies. That's really the secret is like there's, you know, 36 distributors, I think, in the U.S. or something okay. like that. There's a lot of okay. them. They all on their website have a spot, say, submit a film. And it's like why don't you like why don't people yeah you can do that yeah it's work yeah and that's it i think that that repetitive work is what really makes the film and, and just putting in that labor of just like all nighters of just like submitting crap constantly and so eventually passion river uh out of new jersey picked it up and i was thrilled to work with them their their whole thing is working with like community impact style docs and or mm-hmm. films not just docs but community pa- impact stuff and and they're awesome to work with in that aspect and got the film onto the platforms and everything gotcha and so i can't wait to work with them on the next one yeah. yeah 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 that's amazing are there any ones and you don't have to name them are there any that you passed on for a specific word in their agreement or something like that uh things to sidestep there were a couple that were a little too eager that we were Mm. like they were just trying to get us to sign and i passed on it there's also like certain things that filmmakers complain about but like all distributors are gonna do and like i was looking for that because like some of them were like oh you don't need to do that but i'm like Mm. so like for example, errors in emissions insurance is very expensive and all filmmakers have to do it, you know, when yeah. you get a film distributed. But uh, one of them was like, yeah, we, we take care of the errors in emissions. And to me, that was actually a red flag. Interesting. Yes, that's nice of them, but that's just not customary. And mm. you, it's usually on the filmmaker's shoulders and like liability sake, I get why it's on the filmmaker's shoulders. So that to me mm-hmm. was actually a red flag and, and we steered clear of it. A lot of these places you especially with those relationships that you make you are literally putting yourself at the right place at the right time but sometimes it just happens right 
I want you to talk about the random right place at the right time that you were at on January 6th. Everyone knows it. Yeah, January 6th was the insurrection here in the United States. And uh, I'm still in many ways processing what happened myself. But uh, mm. a friend of mine that I had made on the right girls uh, had texted me. He's he's a photographer from New York and he was coming down to cover uh, the rally. So there's a rally in the morning and then we knew that there was going to be protesting in the afternoon. But usually mm. uh, the Trump protests that I had been to, which was not many, were a lot of pomp and circumstance. So, mm. you know, people out there and they'll, you know waving whatever and in their camo and doing their thing and then we figured we'd go out and have drinks afterwards um Mm. and just catch up because i hadn't seen him in in several years because of the lockdown Mm. and so uh yeah so i went down to dc and uh i decided not to go to the rally itself i was just going to go to the protests afterwards because the whole goal was to actually just grab drinks i should have known when i got there and i couldn't find parking that mm. there was an issue because DC is usually mm. really easy to find parking. People don't own cars in Washington DC, so like yeah. it's yeah, actually yeah. super easy. And so I par- yes. parked in my usual spot, and I, I walked down to Pennsylvania Avenue, and there was just thousands of people walking mm. towards the Capitol building. And wow. so I just joined the crowd and started walking towards the Capitol. Uh, mm. And I got there about. About one thirty or so, and they'd already pushed up onto the steps of the Capitol, and it was just mm. mayhem. Mm. And then I went around to the, the east side of the Capitol, which it turns out was an interesting decision, and I'll come back to that. But I went around to the east side of the Capitol. They had pushed up onto the steps of that, and that's actually where they were breaching the Capitol and going inside of it. And I just spent the afternoon filming on the steps of the Capitol and right at the doors uh, as they were going in and out. And uh, The guy with the horns that everyone talks about, I (laughs) stood next to him for several hours as I was Mm. filming and stuff. It was crazy. And it was, it was crazy because like I did not realize the gravity of it. Maybe in the moment I was just focused on my doing the job. I was watching my phone. You know, I was checking my phone maybe every 40 minutes. I knew these people didn't particularly care for journalists. Uh, Mm. so I was just trying to like, you know, work very slowly. I'm not filming a ton. I'm just taking shots when I felt comfortable and like making sure I always had an escape plan. Like if things did go south on me, like which way Mm. was it going to go out of here? And so, yeah, I just filmed for several hours and, and a major news outlet picked up all the footage and and distributed it. It wasn't until I got back to my car that evening, I was like, I realized like the entire earth kind of shut down for that day and was mm-hmm. was glued to the TV footage mm-hmm. and everything. And like, just yeah. thinking about like how I, I just happened to randomly end up there. And yeah. I did end up seeing my friend, like as the national guard <laughs> is like pushing them back. We did run into each other and got ourselves a selfie, like with the national guard of the Capitol behind us. It's like shit is going down. <laughs> like talk about like, so I didn't get to see him. Yay. <laughs> oh, my gosh. You had, you had told me about getting getting the call, like, on the steps uh, from this major news outlet. Yeah, another close friend of mine, I had texted her the night before. I was like, hey, are you going, are you going down? And she's like, no, nah, I've got too much work. They had called her. And then she's like, hey, he's there. I know he is because she mm-hmm. couldn't get a hold of me. Um, (laughs) and then, uh, and so that's when, when I got contracted. So you go into, to, to DC a lot. Um, at first I thought you were based in DC. You're not, you're in Baltimore. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the way I've kind of like structured the last six or seven years is that I ended up in Baltimore and the cost of living in Baltimore is way more affordable than DC. Yeah. Before the pandemic, I'd say it was about a third. I think it's down to about half now because Baltimore Mm -hmm. is coming up quickly and DC has kind of gone stagnant as people moved out of the city. We'll see what happens now that we're kind of like in this next wave. But yeah, it's been a much cheaper place to live. It's one hour into DC, which like on the East Coast is kind of a long ways. But like if you're in LA, like everyone's like, (laughs) <laughs> one hour drive? That's not bad. That's it? Yeah. That's like across town, if that. <laughs> Plus, Baltimore has a lot of great stuff. And yeah, my cost of living here is is cheap and there's a great film community. And it's just mm-hmm. Baltimore is a wonderful city to live in. 
but most of the clients are in DC. Uh, there's yeah. great airports there that I can catch flights out of. Uh, and DC is like one of those markets that like, because it's not just filmmakers like LA or like other cities might be, there is an abundance of work and not enough people to do it. It's been like, That sounds fun. amazing. <laughs> it is. It's incredible. And like, and a lot of it's super easy. It's a lot of talking head interviews for different mm-hmm. groups that need stuff done. And so it's really, you know, you, you're always easy in and out. Money. Yeah, exactly. You're in and out by five o'clock. It's none of these 10 hour days or anything. It's it's wonderful. <laughs> and so I'm always telling people do that. And then Baltimore's filmmaking, they have, uh, there's a grant that I'm always telling people about here in Baltimore. As a filmmaker, you can apply for up to $50,000. It can be used for development. And the only requirement is you have to live in Baltimore. Stop. That's it. Wait, what? Yeah. It's Wait, what, the what's the? Sol Zentz Innovation Fund. But Say it again slowly. Sol Zentz Innovation Fund. Okay. All right. It's incredible. And I'm always saying, like, <laughs> move to Baltimore. They don't even have enough filmmakers. Like, yeah. That's the kind of supportive film community that's here. And a lot of great docs have been coming out of here because of that kind yeah. of mentorship and, and, mm-hmm. and cash flow and stuff. So, like, particularly for people who are looking to go into documentary, not necessarily narrative, yeah, or yeah. narrative, too. There, there is some narrative going on. I don't want to speak too far out of turn, but in the narrative, they had all the tax stuff set up like a lot of states did. Then they rolled mm-hmm. them back. And Mm -hmm. then all the narrative went away. They've recently put them back into place. And hopefully more of that will come back into town. But like, yeah, I think they did take a pretty major hit on the narrative side. Gotcha, Um, gotcha. So narrative. But documentary. Yeah, doc. Goldmine. Well, in journalism and the intersection between those two. Yeah. It's, 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 I can't think of a better place really to live for this. So we're going to wrap up by asking some tools of your trade. All right, hit me. Really quick. All right, what gear or gadget or even software is your favorite old reliable? Ooh, old reliable. Mm -hmm. Uh, I love audio. I think good docs are built around good audio. So my MKH416 microphone never leaves me. Uh, That's my favorite microphone. The other gadget I've been shooting with a lot is is the uh, Tascam DRL10. And it is mm. a field recorder. You simply throw an SD card in and it, it records. Oh, that's so awesome. That's so freaking cool. Yeah, it looks like a lavalier mic, but you don't have to worry yeah. about the interference. And in DC, that's crucial because there's just so much interference. So yeah. like I don't even I don't even own labs anymore. I just have this. Whoa. Okay. So does it have any quirks? Like you've run into like, oh yeah, it does like this weird thing when you like the, the downside is you can't monitor your audio. Oh, okay. Okay. So you clip it onto somebody and pray that it works. Like the batteries are yeah. reliable. It has an auto mm-hmm. leveling function and everything. So it, it, I've never had any problems, knock on wood. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so I mean, that might that might work for this next question, but uh, I'm, I'm going to ask it anyway. What's your favorite new gadget that revolutionizes how you work? Uh, lights. Uh, I've been shooting with uh, Stella Pros. Huge fan of them. Stella so Pros, okay. S- Stella Pros, they're, um, they're a light. They're the size of, uh, think of like a large beer can. Okay. Uh, like, like one of the tall ones. Yeah, yeah. They have a built-in battery that lasts for 90 minutes. You can submerge them down to like 100 meters. You can drop <laughs> okay. them from three feet. Yeah. Uh, and, and they work like a traditional Fresnel. They don't work like a, like the panels or everything so you can put barn doors on them and really control your light so i'm always shooting really? through silks and stuff and i okay, just okay i like the control i don't really like light bleeding all over the place is it kind of like led or it is an led yeah okay so uh, would you have um kind of like mobile and it um has remotes and everything to yeah, turn them on sweet yeah. sweet okay so the current project that you are excited about now Ooh. You know, right now I don't have a current project, which I know is always taboo to say. I, I will be doing another probably like journalism news style doc in the next mm. you know year or two. But, you know, post pandemic right now, it's just trying to get financially back on my feet. I think like a yeah. lot of filmmakers, things got tight for a little bit there. So mm. uh, just trying to do as much commercial work, especially with all the pence up demand that's just been rolling in. I'm just trying to ride that wave for a while yeah. and then we'll start yeah. on another project. How do people find or follow your work? This is a shameless plug up. Oh, awesome. Check out my website, wolferproductions.com. 
you know, really please go check out the film, The Right Girls. And that's just therightgirlsfilm.com. And it's on currently on Amazon, iTunes, and uh, Google Play and all those. So all the major ones you can find it at. So yeah, please do mm-hmm. go check it out. What question should I have asked you? Oh, you know, my question is about uh, building a good team. Consider the question asked, how do you build a good team? As a doc filmmaker, you do work a lot by yourself, right? So like the, the in Mexico, I did that by myself or, or the insurrection, I was by myself. But I think having a good team behind you that can help with logistics or who are willing to stick by you and then keeping with them. Like AJ, the graphic designer I work with, is the same guy I met in college. You know, they helped me on Adopting Haiti and mm. he'll do the rest of my films probably for the rest of my life. Even if there are better graphic designers out there, which I'm not saying there are, I think AJ's the best. <laughs> I'm going to stick with AJ because he's stuck with me. And I think like, yeah, yeah. I see a lot of filmmakers like, oh, I want to collaborate with this person, this person. But like part of it is good workflow and part of it is just good synergy of building that like yeah. team that's going to stick with you the rest of your life. And just like oh, yeah. saying, I like working with these people. And it's not just about the destination, but the journey of like, these are, mm-hmm. this is my tribe and let's do this together. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is joy in the journey. And honestly, once you find that, it's just like, why? Why Why have to like break in another best friend kind of thing? Yeah. <laughs> like, why would you have to build all that up again? I, so. I, I had some friends that were like dying to help me on the right girls. And I was like, you know, they're going to bail on me. Jo- Johnny and Jesse is their names. Uh, and they, oh, wait, what? <laughs> they, I, I was like, they, you know, they wanted to help translate stuff because we were having a horrible time with all the translations. Yeah. I was like, after three hours of translating, they're going to be like so sick of this because translating is such a big job. But yeah, they, yeah. Those two stuck with it and like oh, okay, uh, okay. they'll de- be definitely be working on my next projects. Yeah, like, yeah. At first, I'm just like, dang, you're calling them out on a podcast. <laughs> like they're going to bail on me. <laughs> so, I thought so. No, I'm saying I was the idiot for not believing oh, them. Oh, oh, like, I, okay, I got you. You know what I mean? But they really went for it. And, like, they just stuck with it. And, like, I could not have pulled that film off without those two. And, like, yeah. it's incredible. Yeah. So. I'm glad it went that way. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, they're jerks. Like, no. Man, I, like, I just, like, it's not like, no, I'm going to stick with AJ. It's not like these other two, Jesse and Jeremy. No, no, no. <laughs> they're going to bail on me. Tim, thanks so much for your time. I appreciate it. All of your wisdom and craziness. Man, keep it real out there. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me on the podcast. And uh, yeah, feel free to reach out. If you enjoyed this interview, follow us right here and on Instagram and check out more episodes at thepracticalfilmmaker.com. If you have comments or know someone who would be a great guest on our show, send in your suggestions to Tanya at thepracticalfilmmaker.com. Be well and God bless. We'll see you next time on The Practical Filmmaker.